Amen. Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, join me in the book of Ephesians. We're in chapter 5 this morning. If you don't have a Bible, there's some provided for you right in the pew rack in front of you. You'll see one that says Bible. And uh, page 978. Page 978 is where we are. We just take books of the Bible and we go verse by verse, line by line, chapter by chapter uh, through them in order to uh, yeah, hear what God says to us. That the song that we just sang would be more than just a song, but it would be our prayer. That God would change us from our heads to our toes. Everything that we have, everything that we are, everything we say and do, it would all be about him and for him. Because that's, that's the reason that God made us, to be people who, who honor him in all things. So let's go ahead and ask God for help in the proclaiming and the receiving of his word. And then we'll dive into Ephesians chapter 5. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning and we pray that you would help us to believe everything that you promise and to obey everything that you command. That by your spirit, you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and minds to understand and hearts to believe and wills that are surrendered and affections that are warmed and bodies that are poised and ready to be used for you. God, would you overcome all of our weakness, all of our weariness, all of our sorrows and grief and distractions and burdens, Lord. Would you overcome all of that even now, all of our doubts, all of our confusion? Oh, Lord, overcome it by the power of your Spirit. Would you take your Scriptures and apply them to our hearts in a way that would change us forever? We pray for those who do not know you, who are here this morning. Lord, we pray that you would meet them uh, where they are and that you would show them the glories of Christ. And we pray for those who, who do know the Lord Jesus, that we would walk in the light as he is in the light, and that you would mark our lives distinctly as set apart from the world and set apart unto you. Do this for your glory and our joy. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, I was not always a Baptist pastor. Uh, Before I was a Baptist pastor, I was a pretty disobedient kid. Grew up in West Virginia, uh, about an uh, hour and a half from here, and uh, one of the things that I tended to do, end of my time in high school and beginning part of college before I got converted, was that whenever my parents would go out of town, I would throw epic parties. Um, now, my parents told me not to do this. They said, you do not invite friends over without letting us know, uh, do not have parties at the house when we are gone. And I would say, of course, whatever you say, mom and dad. But Occasionally, when they would leave, we would throw parties. And um, on one particular occasion, we had, we had a big party going on. Uh, this was just a, a little bit before I got converted. And uh, we were downstairs. The lights were off. The music was going. There was, there was a lot of things going on that were, were not pleasing to the Lord. Um, but it was, at that time, it's what I loved. It was what I was about. I was about the darkness, and I loved the darkness, and I was in the darkness. And the party was going along, all was well, and then all of a sudden, the music stopped, and the lights turned on, and everybody kind of went like this. And then on the steps appeared Big Jim. My dad's name is Jim, and he's big. And he was descending down the stairs, and all of a sudden, light shined into the darkness, and dad appeared, and everyone screamed and ran and into the mountains and wherever they went. And there I was standing, left alone, all my friends gone, and I'm standing, and, well, judgment began. It was not pretty. But one thing that was really clear is that, that we could not keep living as we were when we were in the darkness. Because light had shined in, dad had come, and something was going to change. Well, the Bible is very clear that the same sort of thing is happening, that all of us are in darkness going about doing the things that we love, but that a day is coming when the sky will be rolled back like a scroll and God's glory will shine through with the return of Christ and judgment will begin. But in God's mercy, he has given a word before that day, one that I wish that I had heeded, a word that says, Repent, prepare, judgment is coming. Turn from your sin and trust in Christ and walk into the light with the one who is light. And that's what's happening in the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is teaching us that a day of judgment is fast approaching. But 
that in God's mercy, the light of the gospel has shined in and it arrests sinners and awakens us to our sin, draws us to repentance, and now we are to walk in a way that follows Jesus, a way that is marked by light. That's what our text is all about this morning. The first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, we see that we are, for those who have turned from their sins and trusted in Christ, that we are in Christ. We are no longer dead in our trespasses and sins in which we once lived. We are no longer in the darkness, but now we have been raised to walk in the newness of life in the light of the glory of God. Now, just to back up to grab context here, last week we heard chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. I'm just going to read a little bit of that because where we go Uh, where we're going this morning, is kind of a springboard out of that. Look again at chapter 5, verse 1. Be imitators of God is the exhortation. Verse 2, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Then verses 3 and 4, we see that our lives would be marked by purity and not perversion. 4, verse 5, you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, saying, oh, it doesn't matter what you do, you can live however you want. For because of these things, all of the evil just listed there in verse 5, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. That's where we left off last time. Anticipation of certain future judgment should affect us now. It should inspire holy living today. It should awaken people who don't know Jesus and cause them to flee to Jesus for mercy. And if that's you here today, you know yourself to not be a Christian, you are welcome. The word for you today is that judgment is indeed coming. Flee from your sin and flee to Jesus. There's new life in him. And for those of us who are in Christ, This word for us is to to be very careful to not fall back into old ways, but to stay on the new path that is paved by the grace of Christ, because the day is coming when we will give an account to God. And no matter what any friend or family member or celebrity says, do not be deceived. God is not pleased with evil. Therefore, you must not associate with it, participate in it which is where he goes in our text this morning, verse 7. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible, for anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. We're going to try and summarize verses 7 through 14 this morning. It might go something like this. Strive to please God by separating from the darkness. Strive to please God by separating from the darkness. We're going to uh, consider this section in, in three parts. Separate from darkness, verses 7 and 8. Seek to please God, verses 8 through 10. And then stand against shameful ways, 11 through 14. Separate from darkness, 7 through 8. Seek to please God, 8 through 10. And then stand against shameful ways. Striving to please God by separating from the darkness. Let's consider first the call to separate from darkness in verses 7 and 8. Look at it again. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Now the first word that we see there in verse 7 is therefore. It it teaches us that there's a connection between what was just said and what is being said now. 
So in light of the soon coming judgment on those who indulge in evil, in light of that, do not become partners with them. Don't partner with evildoers. The the word partner here, it means to to share something in common, Uh, whether it be a possession, you know, we, we, we own a home together, or, or a relationship. We're, we're buddies. We're friends. We, we have a common partnership. We, are, yeah, we, 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 are, we, we have a common commonality. Now, he says here, do not become partners with them. Who's the them? Well, it's not simply evil practices, but evil people. He's saying don't lock arms in partnership with people who are rebelling against God and who want to go the way of darkness. Don't be partners with them. Now this imagery is important to understand here, the imagery of darkness and light. Darkness describes those who are separated from God, whose lives follow error and are marked by various sorts of evil and immorality. We saw this described in chapter chapter 4. It's the way of death. All right, that's, that's those who are in darkness. And by the way, just to be really clear, everybody who's ever been born was born into the darkness. We are born naturally rebels. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. That's naturally who we were. But when God intervenes and gives new life, you are born again when you trust in Christ, and now you become light. So the metaphor for light describes those who are united with God by faith in Christ, whose life is now marked by living out his truth. And we are holy people. We are set apart from the world and set apart to God. It's darkness and it's light. It's imagery that's used by Paul and John and elsewhere throughout the Bible. And so the command here is, do not become partners with those who are of the darkness. Now what this doesn't mean is he can't be friends with unbelievers or do business with unbelievers. In fact, I would say if you're a Christian and you don't have any unbelieving friends, I would encourage you to change that. Like, get to know people at work. Get to know your neighbors. You should have friends who don't know the Lord. If you, if you don't, please come and talk to us about that. We'd love to help you think about how to develop friendships with, with the people that God's placed around you. So this doesn't mean that you, that you can't be, be friends. It doesn't mean that we should separate in every way, like, like monks or Mennonites or Amish, who, who are going to do their best to separate from the world and just stay away from evil as much as, as possible in, in their perception of it. Actually, Paul tells us that's, that's not the way the Christians should be thinking about li- their lives. 1 Corinthians 5, 9, he says, I wrote to you not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy or the swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. He's like, if you're going to get away from people who sin, you're going to just need to move to another planet. But then there'd be sinners on that planet because you'd be there. So he's like, you can't get away from people who sin. This is, this is not that sort of instruction at all. But believers are called to be salt and light among unbelievers, not withdrawn and secluded from unbelievers. Okay? But it does mean that as we're among our unbelieving friends and coworkers and neighbors, that things should look different with us. Because we refuse to partner in attitudes actions, and causes that are dishonoring to God and displeasing to God. So we are in the world, but not of the world, if you remember our first sermon uh, in this this series. And, And Paul tells us why we are refusing to partner with sinners in their sinning. Verse 8, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. You don't partner with unbelievers in their sinning because that's not who you are anymore. You were that. You notice here the past tense. You used to be darkness. Now, it's really interesting. Notice he doesn't say you were in darkness, which you were, or that you did dark things, which you did, but you were darkness. 
it, it, was our, it was our very nature. It was our identity. It's who we were. Apart from God, we are darkness. We are like Adam and Eve, hiding away from God in, the, in our sin and in, in the darkness. We were dead men walking, evil deed doing people. We were avoiding the light of God's will. We were mocking and dismissing the truth of God's word and all of God's ways. We didn't want anything to do with it. Rather, we were associating with the world and its rebellion. That's who we were. Everybody starts that way. Now, I will say if you had a young conversion, praise God that he delivered you out from that. But we all begin like that. And he says, but now. See that? But now, there's been intervention by God, but now you are light in the Lord. He doesn't say you're in the light, which you are, or that you do things in the light, which you do. But you are light. There's a new nature, a new identity in the Lord. Did you catch it there? Your light in the Lord. Now, if you remember from our first sermon in Ephesians, that's a big deal, that phrase, in the Lord or in Christ. It showed up 29 times in the first three verses. This is who you are in Jesus. We are united to Jesus. Jesus is the light of the, he's the light of the world. So, because we're in him, we now are light. Which is what Jesus says, Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Jesus says, you're, you're in the world, but you're not of the world. You're, you're in darkness as light radiating out. Not so everybody looks at you and be like, oh, you're awesome. But no, that God gets glory. Like, why do you do the things you do? Because God has changed my life. If it was left to me, I'd be doing whatever I wanted to do because I loved my sin, but God, for some reason, loved me. And he, he chased me down, and he saved me, and he rescued me. So I'm not better than anybody else, but God has, has shown me mercy, and I love him now. And because I love him now, I want to seek to live for him now. Now, that sounds nice, and in here, people will even say amen to that. Praise God for the, those of you who are. I heard all two of you. But when we go out into normal life, when we're not in the, the holy huddle, the Bible bubble, it's not that easy or pleasant, right? I mean, most people don't look at the way we live and be like, oh, that's pleasant and nice. No, it, that's right. She knows. She's been out there. She's seen some stuff, all right? She knows. <laughs> like, no, that's not the way it is. You are bigoted fools who are going to die off like dinosaurs. That's the way the world perceives Christians. But if you're in Christ, we must not succumb to the pressure of name calling and misunderstanding and all of that kind of stuff. But rather, if we are in Christ, we need to not be of the darkness. We need to not lock arms with doers of darkness, but be willing, by the grace of God, to have courage to lean into Jesus and his strengthening power in the context of other believers holding us up in the midst of it and walk in the light. Let me give you a couple examples of what that might look like in our day. So believers can work with unbelievers, but we must not adopt worldly business practices. Let's just talk about your workplace. So you can have a job where you work with or work for or hire unbelievers most of you do that, okay? So how many of you have a job where there's unbelievers around you? So, see if people work for the church who have their hands up. No, hopefully not. Um, so that's all right. We'll work on that afterwards. Um, anyway, most of us, that's our normal lives, right? That's our, that's our, that's our reality. And that is, that is fine. We've seen that already. But we must be very careful in our doing of business to not lock arms with unbelievers who do business in an unbelieving sort of way. Now, I want to be very clear, not all unbelievers are dishonest. But many are, in lots of different ways. The world wants money. It wants power. It wants influence. It wants recognition. And when you love that, the Bible says you're going to do whatever you need to do to get it. 
The world will lie to get it. It will cheat to get it. It will steal to get it. It will deceive customers in order to pad pockets. It will twist things to make them look one way when they're really not. They'll give you small print on stuff so that you'll still buy it, even if it means it's not good for you. And God hates evil. So Christians must not do business in evil ways. Listen to this from Proverbs 11.1. 1. A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. So back in the day, you didn't have coins and, you know, uh, whatever else we use. We didn't use coins. You know what I'm talking about. We didn't have money. You didn't have it like that. What you had was in the marketplace, you had scales, right? And merchants, many merchants of the world, they would have two sets of stone weights. And one would be lighter and one would be heavier. This was a common evil practice. And you use the lighter ones when selling things and heavier ones when buying things in order to tip the scales in your favor and to deceive the person that you're doing business with. This literal translation of Proverbs 11.1 1 is balances of deceit, where you would cheat people and steal from people in the marketplace. God says, if you're my people, you don't adopt that practice, even if everybody else does. He says, because I hate it. Leviticus 25, 14, if you make a sale to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor, you shall not wrong one another. Christians, do not do world in, do not do business in worldly ways. Stay in the light. Speak the truth. Don't be a deceiver. Colossians 3.23 tells us why. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord, not for people, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. That means at work, your, your audience is one. I'm filing this report in a way that pleases Jesus and I know that one day he'll reward me for it. I'm dealing with this customer in a way that pleases Jesus, and I know one day I'm going to be rewarded for it. Everything you do must be done in ways that please Jesus and are not marked by evil and deceit and crookedry, if that's a word. It should be now. Like, don't do that. So I want to ask you, does, does your place of employment use evil means to make money? Do you, do you lock arms in ways that make you culpable in lying, cheating, stealing, slandering? A couple years ago, I sat with a, a sister from this church in my office who had landed her dream job. She had moved here. This was, this was the thing she had always wanted to do. But after a few months, her boss began to ask her, to intentionally lie about competitors in order to make the business look better. He was telling her to slander. And the boss said, either you do this or I'm going to fire you. She quit. And she said, because she didn't have a fallback plan, she says, it is better to be poor and please Jesus than to be rich and grieve Jesus. I will obey him and let him handle the consequences. That's what it means to be a Christian. You say, I'm not, I'm not going to lock arms with darkness. I understand there's a lot of gray areas and things to sort through, but be careful how easy it is to get used to doing things and have excuses for it. I'll give you a second one. Believers may be able to work for companies that endorse evil causes, but we must not personally endorse evil. Believers may be able to work for companies that endorse evil causes, but we must not personally endorse evil. So for instance, I'd be happy to talk with you if you disagree, but I have a very, very hard time seeing how a believer could, in good faith, work for, say, Planned Parenthood. 
where a significant number of, significant percentage of their services center around abortion. I'd be happy to talk with you about that if you disagree, but that being said, I can see how a believer could work for a company that supports, say, uh, L- LBGTQ plus agendas. For instance, I think you could work for Starbucks or for Disney. At the same time, believers, because they don't want to lock arms with evildoers, I'm just going to say it, should not wear a rainbow, as it were, in support of those causes, because it signals affirmation of sin that God says sends people to hell. Let me give you an example, example of what this might look like. On June 4th, during Pride Month, uh, Tampa Bay Rays uh, Major League uh, team, uh, Tampa, I'm sorry, Tampa Bay uh, Rays, a, a Major League Baseball team, um, was going to have uh, Pride Day, and they planned to wear uniforms with a rainbow logo on it. Well, on that team, there's several Christians, and they chose to not wear the logo, and it, it caused quite a big stink on the internet. Um, and picture Jason Adams. He specifically chose not to wear them. And this is what he said. He said, it's a hard decision because ultimately we want people to know that all are welcome and loved here. But if we put the rainbow symbol on our bodies, I think a lot of guys decided that that's, that's just that's a lifestyle that we don't want to encourage because we believe in Jesus, who's called us to live a lifestyle that would abstain from that behavior, just like Jesus encourages me as a, a, a heterosexual male to abstain from sex outside of marriage. It's no different. Now that's, again, that is a a weighty, very relevant sort of thing to consider. But this brother, he took a stand against associating with unbelievers in a way that that takes a lot of courage. Now again, he loves his teammates. He, he himself, if you go on to listen to it, he did a whole podcast, I'm happy to point it to you. He does an excellent job of talking about the fact that we think that everyone should be treated as image bearers, that we should love our neighbor as ourself, regardless of their sexual orientation and understanding of whatever, how they perceive themselves and all that, that we should, regardless of who they are, we should love them. That is very clear. But in, we live in a day where if you don't affirm something, it's, it's viewed as hate, And we just want to say that Christians should not succumb to that deceitful lie. It's not true. You can love people and disagree with them. Paul's telling us here, if you're going to follow Jesus, you must be unwilling to accept and endorse and celebrate things that God says in the text right here that Bill preached last week, that it will keep people from entering the kingdom of God, and that it will incite the wrath of God upon them. It is not loving to call good what God calls evil. And listen, this requires great prayer and wisdom and humility and discernment, but I want to encourage you, do not give in to fear. Fear will tempt you to retreat with cowardliness or to retaliate in anger. I want to encourage you to trust Jesus is with you and he will empower you to not be partners with darkness in whatever way it may show up. Now, I want to be clear as we, before we move on to point two that being in the light does not mean that you have to be a jerk about it. There's a very wrong way to be right and some people have PhDs in that and I would encourage you to not. Okay? Be kind, but be clear. Be courageous, but be compassionate. But beware. Because the fear of man is a snare, and it cripples many of us from walking in the light of God's ways and pleasing him. Jesus will be with us, but we must separate from darkness. And I just want you to know, the price on this is only going up socially. You will lose jobs. You will have to reorient careers. You will have friends and family who do not understand you. And this is where I think the American church is going to be reaping what it has been drinking up for decades of the I, me, my gospel, that it's all about me and as long as I'm thought of well and I'm the center of all things and, you know, my you know, self-worth and all of that. I just want you to know that, like, 
that is not going to give us strength to endure in the days ahead. We need a nearness to Jesus where he is big and where he will help us to be able to love people and to represent him, him well. So, separate from darkness. Secondly, in verses 8 through 10, seek to please God. Seek to please God. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. So we go and receive here a, a clear command. Walk as children of the light. That word walk, it shows up seven times in Ephesians, and it, and it, it describes a, a way of life. If you have the NIV, it'll translate it, live this way. Walk this way. Live this way. Live out the new you, is what it's saying. Right? That if you are in Christ, you are a child of light, so act like who you are. He said it a different way earlier back in chapter 4, 22. Put off the old man who is darkness and put on the new man who is light in the Lord. Conform your life by the power of the Spirit to the life of Jesus. So, so when we sin by partnering with darkness, we misrepresent Jesus. Because Jesus would never sin. So we don't steal we don't partner in stealing because Jesus would never steal, but he himself rather trusted his heavenly father to give him everything that he needed, and he lived with a life of, of contentment and generosity. Walk that way. Walk as a child of light. We don't lie because Jesus would never lie, but instead he was truth, and he spoke truth that both honored God and edified others and pointed them to the path of life. So walk in light by speaking truth. We don't engage in, immor uh, engage in immorality because Jesus would never do that. Rather, he used his body to serve others and to help others draw close to God by laying down his life on the cross. Not to pull others away from God in the way that he used his, his body. So walk in light. Walk in holiness following the way of Jesus. That's what verse 9 is about. It's the fruit of light. The fruit of light is fruit produced by light. Throughout the Bible, the, the, the metaphor of, of fruit is often used. It's, it, it, it's simply it, fruit is it's produced in you revealing what you are. So if you look at a tree, you can know if it's an apple tree or a, a peach tree, how? By its fruit. Sure, you can look at the leaves and the roots. I know some of you know more about trees. Not me. I got, I got, and I can even look at the two. I got to taste them. I don't even know the difference. Okay, so they're both red. But um, the point is that, like, you know what the tree is by the fruit that comes out of it. Apple trees do not produce pineapples. That's a different thing. It's a different fruit. Well, there is fruit of light here. So either sin comes out of you which is, verse 11, unfruitful works of darkness, or worship comes out of you, fruit of light, which is good, like Jesus, which is right, like Jesus, which is true, like Jesus. So by the power of the Holy Spirit, we, chapter 5, verse 1, seek to be imitators of God. We're seeking to live like Jesus. And then in verse 10, he, he clarifies this even more for us. He says, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. So walk as children of light by trying to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. The word discern there, it means, it means to put something to the test, to examine it, to approve it after evaluation. What that means is for the believers, do not just get on cruise control and just ride toward heaven, not worried about what we think, do, or say. That's the very opposite picture of the Christian life. Rather, we recognize that everything matters. Every encounter, every word, everything we do or do not do, engage in or refrain from, everything matters because God sees it 
and it should be done in a way that pleases the Lord rather than, Ephesians chapter 4, grieves the Spirit. Everything you do will either please the Lord or grieve the Lord. Which, by the way, this has been one of the most helpful things for me in my personal fight against my own personal sin. It's, it's remembering that everything we, that we are in a relationship with God. Do not live the Christian life just in a dead religion kind of way where you have some facts and you're a robot and you just kind of go through the motions and do stuff. That's not the Christian life. The Christian life is that you have a new heart that's now a heart of flesh that's enlivened by God, that his spirit dwells in you and unites you to know him and see him and enjoy him and to know him personally. You have a, if you are in Christ, you have a true relationship with God through Christ by the spirit. You're united with the Trinity to know him, love him, and enjoy him. And now everything that we do should be done in light of that relationship. Now, I do think some teasing this out just a little bit might be helpful for us. I want to talk briefly about our relationship with God and our fellowship with God. So our, 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 our union, if you will, and our communion. Our union with God or our relationship with God is sealed and secure in Christ. It is immovable, irrevocable, because it is based upon the righteousness of Jesus. If you are in Christ, God will never love you more or love you less. It is signed, sealed with the blood of Christ, sealed by the Spirit of God until the day of redemption. You are his. Nothing can separate you from his love. You are a child of God. Just as my children. They are my kids no matter what they ever do. No matter what decisions they make whether it's pleasing or displeasing, break my heart or enliven my heart. They are my children. I love them no matter what. But our fellowship with God is, is a little bit different. It is, it's part of the relationship, but it's, it's the temperature in the room, if you will, of, of the relationship. Our fellowship with God is sustained by his grace, yet it's maintained, at least in part, by our obedience to Jesus. This means your fellowship with Jesus is dynamic. It's, it's in some sense dependent upon what we say and what we do and how we live, which means you can be more or less pleasing to the Lord. So in the same way, my kids are all my children, and I love them no matter what, but depending on how things are going, sometimes our fellowship is warmer or not. Same kind of thing in every other relationship that we have, right? There's, you you kind of know. So our job as believers is to seek in everything to be pleasing to the Lord. It tells us right here, right? Um, try to discern what's pleasing to the Lord. Sift through things. 2 Corinthians 5, 9. We make it our aim to please him. I'm going to say this thing. I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to not do this thing. Because, with the aim of pleasing the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 2.4, we speak not to please people, but please God who tests our hearts. So when you're about to say something or do something, your thought isn't, is this going to make everybody happy and comfortable and affirmed? The thought is, does this please God? Both in content and in tone. Is this pleasing to the Lord? By the way, that whole thing, that's your, your life, that's what worship is. So this is an aspect of worship. Sunday mornings is an aspect of worship where we gather, we sing. This is corporate worship. We do Lord's Supper, we hear sermons, we, do, we pray together. But most of your life of worship is not in this room. Most of it's what happens for the rest of your days. So that's why, listen to this, Romans 12 tells us, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. We just sang this song, right? Take my life, let it be. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, set apart, acceptable, pleasing, which is your spiritual act of worship. You want to worship God? Be set apart from evil in all things that you do. And do not be conformed to this world, don't partner with darkness, but be transformed by how the renewal of your mind, discerning that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. 
That's the life of the believer. We seek to please God, right? So we're, we're separate from darkness, and now we seek to please him. So everything that we do as Christians must be run through the filter of, does this please God? When we face a situation or a circumstance or a choice uh, or, or, or some sort of, of, of thing we're wrestling with, the question for the Christian is not, is this comfortable? But is this pleasing to Christ? The question is not, is this safe? But is this pleasing to Jesus? The question is not, will this further my career? But is it pleasing to Jesus? Will this keep me in social graces? Or is this pleasing to Jesus? How do, do I feel like doing this? It's not the question for the believer. The question is, does it please the Lord? Now, how do we know if it pleases the Lord? He's not like a bad father who says, you better obey me or else, and then walks away, and you're like, ah, with what? No. The way we know if it's pleasing to God is you look in the book. You, you, you look in the book. We please God by imitating the life of Jesus by obeying his word by faith. His will that is pleasing to him is in his word. His precepts teach us what is pleasing to him. So if you're in a conversation with someone, let's say you're, you're hanging out with a couple friends and y'all start talking and then you start talking about somebody who's not present. And y'all start talking about, well, you believe she did this, or you believe he's such a this or that. What you've got to know is that there's commands that should come to mind for the Christian. Love your neighbors yourself. How would you want the conversation to go if this was somebody else talking about you? How would you want this to go if they were standing here, or if this was going to be recorded and given to them? Because it's recorded in heaven, and the Lord hears it all. So this is where we, we say, hey, guys, listen, I'm sorry. It's easy to get wrapped up in this. I, I think since they're not here, we should, we should probably not go down this road. I don't think it's very honoring to them. So, um, and if they want to keep having the convo, that's fine. You can go do something else. But you want to not partner in that. Or let's say that you're, you're watching a show. And as you, you're watching this show which you should have screened before you watched it because you have to screen everything you watch because everything's crazy. But let's say you didn't for some reason. And you start watching this show and a scene comes up that is sensual. And it's evident that this is, this is going in a, in a dark direction. The question is, what's going to please the Lord? Because the Holy Spirit is alerting you. Jesus wouldn't watch this. Jesus would not take pleasure in people sinning against him. Jesus would not use other people for his, his own ends. And so you turn it off. Because it's pleasing to the Lord. Or let's say you desire to be, you desire to be, to be married. And nobody, nobody's asking you out. Nobody's receiving your invitations Except for co-workers who for some reason, not some reason, meaning like because everybody else does it. Oh, I'm saying I'm digging a hole. First rule of holes is when you're on stop digging. So <laughs> what I'm saying is everybody at work thinks you're awesome and is trying to set you up with all their friends. But their friends don't know the Lord. Or they're so sussy, you know, like they're super suspect on whether they know the Lord or not. They're like, eh. And they believe in God, Right? But you deep down desire to be married. The question is not, do they think you're pretty? The question is not, why is somebody else not asking you out? The question is not, are they nice? The question is not, were they willing to endure your religion and come to, to church for a while with you? The question is not about their potential. The question is, does dating an unbeliever please the Lord? answer is no. You don't, you don't lock arms with somebody heading toward marriage who does not believe the same things about where you came from, why you're on the planet, where we discern what is good and evil, what happens when we die. Those are significant issues. 
I understand. And listen, I want to say, especially in this day, it is hard to be a single brother and sister who longs to be married, and it's not happening. But it is harder. The way of the transgressor is hard. Do not lean on your own understanding and lock arms with somebody in a way that displeases the Lord. And follow. You, it's, you think being alone, being alone is hard. Being married and alone is harder. I know it's difficult. And the world is going to tell you 10,000 10, times over that this is ridiculous and you just need to enjoy life and it'll work out. God's word is clear. You are free to marry whomever you want in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 7, 39 is very clear. All things that we do, money, time, how we use our bodies, words, relationships, everything is, is it pleasing to the Lord? And I want to be really clear on this last little bit is that living for God's pleasure should not be read here as some sort of cold, miserable, unenjoyable endeavor where we simply jump through hoops because God sits up there like, and likes watching. Like, that's not the way that God is. That could not be further from the truth. But rather, our pleasure, our happiness, our true joy is unavoidably united with God's pleasure. God created us to have happiness and fulfillment and joy as we walk in his ways. Obedience to God gives glory to God and gives joy to us. Listen to this from John 15. The whole section's about Jesus says, abide in me by obeying my word. If you love me, you're going to do this. Hear this. Verse 8, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, the fruit of the light that we're talking about here. So prove to be my disciples. Walk as children of the light, he says. God is glorified in you bearing fruit, good fruit, that's marked out by the very things we've been talking about here. God is magnified and honored when we obey him. And, and, our joy is made full. Life is rigged to where your truest joy is found only in obedience. Listen to this. John 15, 11. These things I have spoken to you, that, about obeying and abiding, bearing fruit for God's glory, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy might be just a little bit better than what you get in the world. Nope. That your joy may be made full. You want full joy? It's in the way of the light. You want full joy? It's, it's not in partnering with all of the little trinkets that the world offers for immediate affirmation and applause and acceptance and indulgence and everything that, yes, I understand it's powerful, but, and that's the power of sin is its immediacy to, you know, to satisfy, but the aftertaste of sin is always bitter. Sin always hides the price tag. Obedience in the moment is sometimes very difficult, but the, the aftertaste is always sweet. Always sweet. There was a time this week where I felt very tempted to do something. And by God's grace, I prayed and I resisted. And man, I tell you what, I thought six or seven times since that, I am so thankful that I trusted the Lord. And I didn't just take the situation into my own hands. You're never going to regret obedience to Jesus, both in this life and in the life to come. So discern what's pleasing to him, because it's also the way for your joy. And then finally, verses 11 through 14, stand against shameful ways. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. We are commanded to not partner with wicked ways of darkness, but instead expose them. 
The word exposed there means to, to bring to light, to reveal. So as you live out your obedience to Jesus, as you act like Jesus would act by the grace of God and speak like Jesus would speak uh, by the, the grace of God, it will shine light into the darkness around you. Distinctive living and distinctive speaking exposes darkness. Now I want to be really clear that you need both living and speaking. If you just speak true words, but you don't live them out, that makes you a hypocrite and it makes people hate Christianity. But if you're one of those undercover Christians who's like, well, I'm just going to live my life and they'll know by the way I live that I am a Christian. I just want you to know that's not in the Bible. You can't do that. Why? Because how will they not know that you're not just a moral Muslim or Hindu or atheist or Buddhist? The way they know the distinction and why you do what you do is that you speak words. You tell them about Jesus. You point to Christ. You ask them if they'd maybe read through a section of scripture. If they say, man, you're crazy. Why do you think all this kind of stuff? And be like, you know what? I totally understand. I used to think that way as well. How about this? Would you be willing to read a couple chapters from the Bible and talk with me about it? No tricks here. I just want to hear what you think about what Jesus says. And then you take him through a portion of the Gospel of John, and you pray like crazy that God would use the word and save him. And sometimes he does. Right? But So it takes words and actions. And these things that we do and things that we refrain from doing, they set us apart. Now, I try to not use myself as a positive example uh, very often. I'm going to hear... I just want to say it's a little uncomfortable, but it was the only thing that came to mind for this. So um, after I became a Christian, um, I moved to Texas, started working at a restaurant to pay for seminary a little bit and all this kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm a believer going into ministry, and I work at this restaurant. And it, if you've ever worked in a restaurant, you know it's, it's super shady. Uh, it's this restaurant life is not, it's not normally light. It's darkness, typically. Um, and, but it was interesting how over the, at first... I wouldn't, I wouldn't join in some of the conversations that were going on when we would go out afterwards. I wouldn't, I wouldn't get drunk and indulge in some of the things that people were, were doing. And it quickly, people discovered that I was, I was the preacher. So I was going to seminary, I was going to be a pastor. Um, and they discovered that I was a Christian. And it was incredible to watch. They started to call me the walking conscience. So I would, I would not do any, I would just walk up to get some biscuits. And they'd be like, oh, shh, shh, shh. Like this, like, hey, how are you today? I was like, what do you mean? And they would just stop whatever they were doing because there was, there was the presence of light there. Now, again, I was not perfect. And there were several times, actually, that I said and did things I shouldn't have done that I had to come back and ask them to forgive me. And they thought it was weird. They're like, why are you asking us to forgive you? I was like, I know you don't understand, but I didn't represent Jesus very well. I need you to, I need you to forgive me for that. And it was really interesting how God used light there to work in the lives of some unbelievers but there was one guy there who had, I don't know if he was a Christian or not, but he came to me and he, he talked about himself being a Christian and that he knew that he was not living in the way of Christ. And it really began to convict him and to, so I, don't, I, don't, I ended up quitting and moving uh, to a, a different job uh, after a little bit, but I don't know what ended up happening with him, but it was interesting to watch how the light shined in. And I want to plead with you to pray that God would give you grace to be light wherever he's put you. Plead with him to not, not be afraid of what people will think about you, but serve in the way that Christ would and speak in the way that Christ would and allow it to radiate out. And it will help those who do not know Christ and who have all kinds of misconceptions about what a Christian is to be able to get a glimpse of of who Jesus really is. But I think it's also important for us to understand here in this text that the aim is not only for unbelievers, but in one sense, it seems to be aimed primarily at believers. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. He's telling believers, don't, leave this, don't live this way. And one of the things I've been really burdened by over the past couple of weeks here is just the weight of our need for holiness. Following Christ is not a casual thing where you just kind of go with the flow and 
try to be cool. And I, I, I feel the temptation so often to not be those kinds of Christians. If I'm honest, that section earlier about the rainbow thing, super uncomfortable for me because I'm a people pleaser who doesn't like to talk about those sorts of things. But cowardliness, it suffocates the soul. Don't be holy in the way that's set apart and arrogant and judging everybody and holier than thou. That's not true Christianity. Forgiven people are a humble people. And, and let light shine in our midst that God might expose it. Sin that's, that's hiding. And, and if you see things that are going on in one another's lives, please, I know it feels uncomfortable to say, hey, can we maybe get together and, and talk? I just want to chat with you about a couple things. And if someone pulls you aside and says, hey, I, this is hard for me to have this conversation with you, but I've, I've noticed a couple things and I just want to talk about it, please don't be prideful and defensive. It may be God's grace saving your life. Be the sort of people who desire light to come in, to expose darkness that needs to be snuffed out. And maybe they're wrong. But I would say, in all the critiques that I've received over the years, which have been minimal, but, um, but with those, like, there's almost always truth in there somewhere. And even if somebody hands you a bag of trash, if you, as it were, and they told you there's a gold bar in there, you're going to dig through to find it. Seek for ways that you can be corrected. And let us be the sort of church that shines light in. Because you can put on the front and say you're a Christian and act like you're a Christian and be harboring great evil in your heart. In a room this large... I just, I sense the need to say, awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead. If you're harboring evil in your heart, please step into the light. In recent weeks, a sister church in our area has recently endured a horrible tragedy. A member of this church was murdered in their own home at night while their family was there. The investigation revealed that the perpetrator turned out to be a fellow church member who had secretly harbored envy and jealousy of this man and the circumstances in his life. They had worshiped together, sang songs together, took the Lord's Supper together. Yet he had allowed his unchecked evil to grow and to own him. I don't say that to scare you, but some of you plot evil in your hearts, and it may not be that sort of evil, may God forbid that, but some of you right now may be plotting affairs or lies about business or 10,000 other things, may the Spirit of God not let you be comfortable, not let me ever be comfortable in that. But sin and darkness is no joke. Sin will never stay put. It is imperialistic. It wants all of you. This word is given to believers to awake, O oh sleeper. We're about to take the Lord's Supper together. I'm going to give a moment of, of silent introspection in which I want to plead with you that if there's ever, if there's any sort of evil that you be harboring or hiding in your heart that you would go before the Lord and plead for mercy and forgiveness if there's something you need to confess to someone else I encourage you send a text to them or write down and commit that you will go and to talk to that person so the Lord Jesus is coming soon may we be a people who in light of that cast off darkness and step into the light and by the grace of God follow Christ no matter what the cost. Because the world and Satan and our flesh will do everything it can to, to put a, a basket over our light. But may we let it shine and burn off all dross that is not from Christ. I'm going to give us a moment of silence and then I'll pray and then we'll share in the Lord's Supper together.